Hello everyone, as part of our Saving Lives webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us online today for this very special live broadcast. My name is Emily Eberly with Sachs Healthcare Communications, and I am your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, eCPR, Mechanical CPR, PCI, and ECMO. Oh my! And now, I'd like to introduce you to Janice Nichols, who is our moderator today. Janice is the Director of Education and Professional Development at Fort Washington Medical Center, Fort Washington, Maryland. She develops community education programs, such as those for stroke and heart disease awareness. Janice is a co-chair of the Code Blue and Stroke Committee and was also the data abstractor for a joint commission pilot relevant to process improvement of stroke care. Additionally, she is the clinical paramedic instructor with Montgomery County Fire and Rescue in Rockville, Maryland. Janice, welcome and I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session and we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? I am, Emily. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Good morning, afternoon, everyone. The title of today's webinar is eCPR, Mechanical CPR, PCI, and ECMO. Oh, my. Speaking today on this very timely topic is a colleague of mine, Nicole Kupchik. Nicole has practiced as a critical care nurse for over 20 years. About 15 years ago, she began working at Harborview Medical Center, a change that spurred an interest in resuscitation. Shortly thereafter, Nicole was part of a a multidisciplinary team that was one of the first in the United States to implement therapeutic hypothermia after cardiac arrest. As part of this effort, Nicole was responsible for protocol development and has published numerous papers on this topic. In 2013, Nicole founded Nicole Kupchik Consulting and Education. The speaker disclosed the following relationships, Speakers Bureau, Physio Control Striker, Medtronic, La Jolla Pharmaceuticals, and Cheetah Medical, Consultant, Physio Control Striker, and Baxter Healthcare. This webinar provides continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. A link to obtain CE credits will be available at the conclusion of this webinar. The accreditation statement is listed below. Support for this educational activity is provided by Physio Control, now part of Stryker. And now I would like to introduce my colleague and friend, Nicole Kupchik. Nicole, are you ready? I'm ready. Good morning, everyone. So um, welcome to the webinar. So today's webinar, just once again, is called eCPR, Mechanical CPR, PCI, and ECMO. Oh, my. So, so this has been really fun. We've been doing this uh, series of webinars over the past year, and um, we're a kind of uh, we've got one more coming in November, but we wanted to revisit this topic of what's called eCPR, where we're really questioning, you know, what the endpoint of resuscitation should be for patients who experience ventricular fibrillation out in the field. So that's what we're going to chat about today learning objectives. So at the end of this activity, I hope you're able to do the following. Describe um, how EMS is evolving and how hospitals can really change strategy for persistent uh, V-fib arrest. We're going to talk about the latest evidence on mechanical CPR as a bridge for circulatory support. And then finally, we are also, we're going to talk about uh, the use of extracorporeal membrane oxygen oxygenation or ECMO to preserve the myocardium uh, until PCI can be performed. So this is really, really a cutting edge topic and um, it is gaining a lot of traction across the country. And then finally, I'm going to talk about the latest outcomes on the use of eCPR. So unfortunately, uh, there's a, a Dimitri Yiannopoulos, who's this amazing physician out of um, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, everybody's kind of anxiously waiting for a paper that he's about to publish on outcomes. So unfortunately, uh, the paper was, has not been published in time for today's webinar, but um, I'll give you my contact information at the end of the webinar, and I would say stay in touch. I'm on social media. Um, you can check my website, but stay in touch, and I'll definitely let you know when he publishes his outcome data, but he's supposed to be uh, publishing a pretty comprehensive paper uh, evaluating a, a number of patients who have received eCPR um, in the Minneapolis area, so that's actually pretty exciting. 
All right, so we're going to start off with a case. Okay, so you got a 46-year-old female who collapsed at a restaurant. So she was having dinner uh, with her family. She had her, I think, her two sons and husband there. And um, collapses at a restaurant, completely unexpected. Uh, so what happened, so everything happened right. So the uh, 911 was called. Uh, CPR got started, EMS got there really quickly, so she's getting defibrillated about every two minutes, so shocking her about every two minutes. They've ma they've uh, maximized the energy, so she's receiving 360 joules. They get an airway placed, but they just cannot get her out of this rhythm. So here's the rhythm, and you can see clearly it's ventricular fibrillation, so it's a shockable rhythm. Uh, there's chaotic firing in the heart. Her end tidal CO2 remains in the high 20s and 30s. So those of you who've been on the previous capnography webinars know that during CPR, that actually is a really good number, right? So a normal one for us with a normal cardiac output um, would be about 35 to 45. So hers with CPR is in the 20s and 30s. So the question is, what do you do? So they're at a restaurant, they're shocking her, shocking her, shocking her, um, can't get her out of this rhythm, what do you do? And so the question is, now what? All right. So why do patients experience ventricular fibrillation? So there's lots of different reasons. Um, can you think of a few? Maybe think in, you know, in your uh, kind of work environment, why have you seen patients go into V-fib? Um, Long, it could be long QT interval, uh, maybe Brugada syndrome, maybe hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. About 30% of patients who have HOCUM find out they have it when they have a, a sudden cardiac death experience. Um, cocaine, so cocaine can actually cause um, coronary artery vasospasm and cause patients to go into V-fib. Um, not common, so all of these conditions aren't very common. But a lot of patients, the reason they go into ventricular fibrillation is they've got a lesion in their coronary artery. So the question is, what can you do in the field to alleviate a lesion in the coronary artery? So when I say in the field, what I mean is pre-hospital EMS. And the answer is nothing. All the treatment that is given is supportive and then interventions to try to break that chaotic electrical rhythm. So now the question that's being asked is should we get these patients to a hospital uh, where maybe they can take them to the cath lab? Um, Again, they, there, there are thoughts that maybe upwards of 80% of patients who have V-fib, who experience a ventricular fibrillation arrest, is due to a lesion in their coronary artery. So should the patient go to the cath lab, you know, do they need something more than what can be offered in the field? And there's many cities across the country um, who now have protocols where they'll try three defibrillation attempts and then they transport the patient to the hospital. So here's a polling question. So Emily, I'm going to have you join us again. And um, everyone get ready to vote. So here's the question I want to know. Is I want to know, does your hospital provide eCPR? So the answer is either yes, no, not right now, but we're considering it, or I have no idea what eCPR is. And that's totally okay, because you're about to learn. So what do you guys think? Okay, I'm excited to know what they have to say. All right, so, oh, wow, so 15% of you are doing this. I mean, that's actually higher than I thought it would be. Um, so 15% of you are doing this. Now, a few of you are considering it, and I have no idea what eCPR is. Okay, so th this is exactly what I expected. So th this is very cutting edge. It's very new. And so we're going to learn about it. All right, Emily, we'll get us back to the slide deck. And we are going, yeah, we're going to talk about what eCPR is. Okay, so super exciting. All right, so eCPR, let's chat about it. So what is eCPR? So eCPR stands for extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And there's three main components to it. Uh, the first component would be using some sort of a mechanical CPR device. And really the only one you can use in the cath lab is the one that's shown. So it's basically a piston type mechanical CPR device um, that you can kind of uh, use fluoroscopy and, and, and image around the device itself. So um, mechanical CPR, because you've got to support the patient and give really good CPR. And this is a really, this honestly is a huge component of doing eCPR. The next is PCI. So the idea of what's causing this V-fib, and like we said, in a lot of patients, it's an occluded coronary artery. Many times, it's the left anterior descending. Um, and then finally, the third part of eCPR is providing ECMO. Um, so ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. I'm actually going to show you a picture in just a little bit. I've got a little picture here, but um, 
but I'll um, go into a little bit more about what ECMO is. Now, ECMO doesn't necessarily have to be part of this. Um, a lot of experts feel like it does. Um, I know other some facilities will use like the Impella device uh, to support the patient, but the whole idea of using ECMO is you want to support um, the patient's cardiac output uh, until you can get the coronary lesion open. And because the last thing you want to happen is to take somebody who's got CPR in progress to the cath lab, you know, get their coronary artery open, and then the patient end up with an injection fraction of 10%, and now they're a cardiac cripple. So that's the last thing you want to happen. So the reason ECMO or maybe Impella would be used is to support the patient and support the myocardial so that their um, myocardium doesn't take a big hit. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it up now and talk about the three components of eCPR. Are you ready for another polling question? All right, so here's the question. Does your facility or EMS agency use mechanical CPR devices? So are you guys using mechanical CPR? We'd love to know. Ooh, look at this. Okay, so 43% of you are using mechanical CPR. That's pretty impressive. 48% say no. A few of you only in the cath lab, and then a few of you are thinking about it. Okay, all right, so let's get back to the presentation, and we're going to talk about what mechanical CPR is. And um, for those of you who um, want more in-depth information about mechanical CPR, I did a webinar on it. Oh, gosh, when was it? In June? I did a webinar um, on mechanical CPR. So if you want... Uh, more information, you can um, watch an archived version of uh, that presentation. Okay, all right, so we are going to move along here. All right, so mechanical CPR. So if you just kind of just think about your, your work environment, you know, when is CPR challenging? And um, there's so many situations where it's challenging. So in the pre-hospital stage, uh, you know, I, I just, there are so, I just, I'm just trying to think about how you would move, be in the back of an ambulance and move, you know, while you're trying to give CPR. It's just, it's very dangerous for the, um, for our, the paramedics and EMTs. Um, you know, in a hospital, let's just be honest, Anytime you're giving compressions on a hospital bed, those mattresses bounce up and down. Um, you know, and a lot of people are like, well, what about the backboard? And, you know, the backboard just bounces up and down with the patient. Um, but in the cath lab, uh, if you've got a prolonged code, I can remember how many times in my career, <laughs> the calling overhead, can anyone come help us do CPR when we have big prolonged codes? Um, you know, I've met a lot of people who work in um, uh like smaller facilities that might only have 10 staff at night, you know, and that would be another con um, situation where mechanical CPR might be an option. And then in morbidly obese patients, CPR can be really, really challenging. So should we re rethink the way we're providing chest compressions? And I've given numerous uh, presentations on um, on uh, chest compressions in the past, just about how challenging they are. So this is a video um, off of YouTube that I'm going to show you guys. So it's a patient. Um, it's not playing very fast because of the internet speed, but um, but you can see it's a patient who's receiving mechanical CPR. And one of the nice things about when you're doing mechanical CPR is you can transport the patient. Um, they're going to get pretty consistent CPR. It's always going to be two inches. Um, you know, one of the key things, though, you know, as you kind of see this device, is you've got to make sure you place it in the right spot. You know, if you don't, you can cause uh, damage uh, to the patient. So that's a key thing is you've got to be able to place it efficiently and, um, and just make sure you put it in the right anatomical uh, position. But you can see they're actually moving this patient to the cath lab with the CPR in progress, and this patient is able to get adequate CPR, um, you know, with the mechanical device. So, so that's what mechanical CPR looks like. All right. So we are going to keep going here. And one of the nice things about mechanical CPR is you can actually, uh, this is a, uh, a CPR report card, um, but you can see this green line is the uh, mechanical chest compression device giving compressions. And what you can do is you can actually stop the device really quick and then restart it. You just assess to see, do I have a shock level rhythm or not? And then you can actually shock the patient while CPR is being given. And so that is a major advantage of using mechanical CPR as well. So what's the data? What do the data show about mechanical CPR? And um, interestingly, uh, there have been two bigger studies published evaluating manual versus mechanical CPR. The one I'm going to go over here um, in, enrolled over 2,500 patients. Um, it was done in Europe uh, where 1,300 patients got 
the Lucas device and uh, 1,289 uh, received manual CPR. And they looked at different um, kind of data points, four-hour survival, uh, uh, hospital survival, and then they looked at follow-up at six months. And interestingly, so if you can imagine, what they did was they randomized patients to either get manual CPR or mechanical CPR. And what they found was there really wasn't much of a difference between mechanical and manual CPR. And so you might be asking, well, so then why should we do this? And the answer is, you know, there's always going to be bias in these studies. Um, there is no way, there's absolutely no way to blind a group that gets mechanical CPR. There's no way to blind it. You've got a big device. And then the other thing, like, for example, in this study, they were uh, measuring the quality of CPR in the manual CPR group. And if you know that someone's monitoring your performance on CPR, how do you think you're going to perform? And, you know, and the, the reality was, was the manual CPR was almost perfect. So when you compare almost perfect CPR to a mechanical CPR device, um, you know, the results were about the same. And that's always going to be, I think, a challenge in studying mechanical CPR is that there's no way to get rid of the bias that's introduced from the inability to blind it. So, um, so anyways, that's one of the big challenges. Now, this was a super interesting study that was done last summer, or published last summer, I should say, called the MECA trial. And MECA stands for Mechanical Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation versus Standard Manual CPR and Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest by Emergency Ambulance Crew. That's a long, a long title there, right? But, um, but what you can see, so um, I'll just kind of move my um, uh, cursor over here by these uh, colored boxes. But the gray group is the manual CPR group. The uh, white bars were going to be the early Lucas group, and then the black is late Lucas. So they, what they did was they assessed, you know, how do things compare or how do outcomes um, compare when we put the, um, when we do manual CPR versus putting the early, Lucas on early. So put it on in the first few minutes of resuscitation efforts versus putting it on late. And late was defined as... Um, when they were getting ready to transport a patient to the hospital. And so what did they find? Well, they found just uh, the metric of looking at return of spontaneous circulation, uh, early Lucas fared the best, and it was statistically significant. Uh, when looking at hospital discharge and survival at 30 days, again, Lucas placed early had the highest survival. So I think the key is if you're going to use a mechanical CPR device, Place it early. Be efficient with your placement and place it early. You know, you can't use anything you use as a last-ditch effort is not going to fare well. And some of you who've worked in critical care and the emergency department might remember leave a fed, which got nicknamed leave them dead because we would, uh, you know, use a, a vasopressor as a last-ditch effort many times in sepsis. And now what we find is when we use it early, there's actually better outcomes. So, all right, the next component of eCPR is taking the patient to the cath lab. So should the patient go to the cath lab is always the big question. So what do the guidelines say? The guidelines say if you get ROSC or return of spontaneous circulation, get a 12 leap. All right, okay, that's kind of, uh, I'm sure most of us are doing that. Um, and then what they're saying is if on that 12 lead, so if you get a 12 lead um, in a patient who has experienced return of spontaneous circulation, um, and if they've got a STEMI or ST elevation on their 12 lead, then take them to the cath lab. Well, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? So, so that's a big no-brainer. We'll take those patients to the cath lab. And then what the guidelines also say is it's reasonable to perform PCI even if they're comatose um, because, you know, we can cool patients and preserve uh, their neurofunction. But one of the really interesting things is there was a case study, um, a, I'm sorry, a case series of patients um, who had a cardiac arrest and got ROSC, and then 58% uh, of those patients didn't have ST elevation on their 12 lead, but still needed PCI, which is kind of a crazy thing. So almost 60% of patients had this big cardiac arrest, didn't have ST changes post-arrest, and needed PCI. So the 12 lead ECG is not perfect. It doesn't tell you everything. So always keep that in mind. So this is an easy one, right? So if you were to look at this 12 lead, pretty easy. What does this patient need? Where do they need to go? They need to go to the cath lab. But this isn't the ECG that we see in a lot of patients. So what does the American College of Cardiology say, you know, about taking um, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients to the cath lab? And 
basically what they do is they give, um, you know, they, they'll kind of say who seems suitable to go to the cath lab. Okay, that's fine. But they have this whole um, list of patients who would have unfavorable resuscitation features. So, for example, if they're non-VFib, if they didn't receive bystander CPR or the arrest was unwitnessed, fine, you know, that kind of makes sense. But I will tell you, a lot of people across the country are questioning the idea of, you know, who cares if they got 30 minutes of CPR? If they got good CPR and title looks decent, let's take them to the cath lab. Um, ongoing CPR. Um, so that is also being questioned. Maybe we should take patients with ongoing CPR to the cath lab. And the reason is, why are they arresting? They are, many of them are arresting because they have an occluded coronary artery. Um, you know, a lactate over seven, you know, you're going to have a high lactate in cardiac arrest. And I'll show you Demetri Yiannopoulos' criteria in just a little bit. But, um, you know, he's like, if their lactate's less than 18, let's still consider them, you know. So anyway, so we're really questioning a lot of these kind of, you know, um, these uh, criteria and maybe asking, well, maybe it's okay as long as they've gotten good CPR, maybe it's okay to still consider them for the cath lab. All right, so here's a case. So you had a 58, 56-year-old uh, patient who was in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So this is one of those patients where um, he arrested, got him back, arrested, got him back. And um, when it, during one of those ROSC periods, a return of spontaneous circulation, they did a 12-lead ECG. So here's this guy's 12-lead. And the question is, what do you want to do with this? Well, I don't know about you, but this is a big old bundle branch block, and we can't tell if this patient has ST elevations or not. So you could see really clearly the patient has a bundle branch block and lead V1, it's upright, so it's likely a right bundle branch block. So what do you do now? Because he's arresting for some reason. Uh, maybe that reason is because he's got an occluded coronary artery. So, you know, would you feel comfortable taking this patient to the cath lab? And, you know, many really progressive cardiologists are saying, yes, let's take him to the cath lab. He's been arresting. Um, we're able to get him back, so he's kind of got this recurrent uh, ventricular fibrillation, why not take this patient to the cath lab and see if we can get them opened? So this is what it would look like if you took a patient to the cath lab. So you can see here, you've got a mechanical CPR device. Um, they can do, now in this case, they're doing um, groin access. Some cases they'll do radial, but um, but in this case, they're doing groin access. Uh, but uh, you, the one of the limitations is you can't get a straight anterior posterior view of the heart. And so you've got to really kind of uh, managed fluoroscopy kind of around the CPR device, which a lot of cardiologists are able to do um, without much difficulty. It's just, it's something you've just got to get used to. But um, but that's what it would look like to be in the cath lab. So this is a, um, a case, the video's running just a little bit slow here, but you can see mechanical CPR is being given and the patient has this really tight LAD occlusion here. I'll go ahead and replay, replay the video. But you can see mechanical CPR is being given and um, this patient's got a super, um, they've got a huge blockage right up here in their LAD. And this, this patient kept re-arresting in the cath lab. And so what the cardiologist did was he deployed a stent to the patient's LAD. You can see now the mechanical CPR device isn't moving. Why isn't it moving? Because once the stent was deployed to the LAD, they reestablished perfusion to that left anterior descending artery and got, were able to successfully shock the patient out of V-fib. So this is the reason, and you know, that we consider taking these patients to the cath lab. In fact, a lot of cardiologists call patients with V-fib arrest in the community the walking dead. Um, you know, they're very survivable. These patients are very survivable if you can get them to the um, cath lab and get those uh, culprit lesions open. So this is just um, a patient who's getting mechanical CPR, and you can see they're going in through the groin, um, able to get access while compressions are being done. So the cardiologist is just making, uh, proving a point that you can access patients with CPR in progress. The next video is just kind of showing you've got mechanical CPR and um, they're putting their, a wire into the uh, coronary lesion. So it's kind of hard to, um, to see all this, but, um, but the patient's getting a wire into the coronary lesion. And then what they're going to do is uh, they're going to stent uh, the lesion. So you can see here stent being deployed and then um, uh, 
they were able to reestablish flow to this patient's coronary artery and able to get the patient out of ventricular fibrillation. So this can be done. Is this um, something that needs uh, maybe you know some extra training and maybe advice from cardiologists who have experience? Absolutely. But the key thing is you've got to give really good CPR while the coronary arteries are you know being uh, stented. So this was another interesting case. I showed this case um, in a previous uh, webinar, but a 49-year-old female who had a remote history of cancer, so she there was nothing active, uh, smoking history, but she had progressive shortness of breath. She had presented to, um, I think it was her PCP, primary care provider, in a clinic, and then they sent her over to the emergency department uh, because she had progressive shortness of breath, chest pain, and then she had a cardiac arrest right in front of the emergency department staff. So she was one of those patients where they got her back and lost her and got her back and lost her. And her end tidal CO2, though, remained decent uh, with really good compressions. Everyone's getting tired. So they place a mechanical CPR device on her. And then the question is, should she go to the cath lab? So should she be considered uh, to uh, as a, a candidate for the cath lab? And the cardiologist said, yes, let's get her to the cath lab. And so they took her to the cath lab thinking that possibly she had a coronary artery. They shot her coronaries completely clean. Then they shot her pulmonaries because something's got to be causing this arrest. And you can see her pulmonaries have big thrombus. There's no perfusion um, getting past that corn, um, that um, uh, pulmonary artery. So this woman had massive pulmonary emboli. And so uh, what happened was she was getting mechanical CPR. Uh, they did a thrombectomy, kind of pulled out as much clot as they could, and um, then put in the ECOS device, so ECOS catheter um, infused intraarterial TPA, and were able to successfully lyse the clot. And, um, but you can see this is post thrombectomy, and look at the difference in perfusion um, into that lung. So this, um, and then once they were able to reperfuse that lung, they were able to get the patient successfully shocked out of ventricular fibrillation. So, you know, again, just huge success stories when we kind of think outside the box and really push the limits and get these patients to the cath lab. So you might be asking, you know, what's the big hesitation to taking everyone to the cath lab? And right now, the limitation is many states have to publicly report their cath lab outcome data. And um, Dr. Carl Kern, who's uh, he's the chair of the ECC, the Emergency Cardiovascular Care Committee with the American Heart Association, uh, for two years. He's really working with the American Car College of Cardiology, the AHA, to exclude cardiac arrest patients from public reporting. It's kind of crazy because right now, um, uh, cardiac arrest patients are included in door-to-balloon public reporting, but cardiogenic shock isn't. And so he wants to get these patients excluded from public reporting so that it breaks down those barriers to considering these patients for, you know, life-saving treatments. All right, so the case summary, um, this patient uh, had a massive pulmonary embolism. A pulmonary thrombectomy was performed. Like I said, they put the ECOS catheter and did um, intraarterial TPA. Uh, she got an IVC filter placed. She transferred to the CCU and fully recovered three days later, which is just kind of absolutely insane. So, But again, she got the treatment she needed. Okay, now the last component I'm going to chat about is ECMO, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So ECMO um, is, is not new. It's, we've been, I, I think, oh gosh, I uh, took care of patients on ECMO in the 1990s, um, but um, ECMO is a it's an option um, to add to this whole idea of eCPR um, to support the patient's heart. So what they'll do is they'll put a cannula in a, um, a big vein and then one in a big artery. And so the type of ECMO that's done for eCPR in cardiac arrest is what we call VA ECMO. So it's veno-arterial ECMO. And so what happens is in one cannula, they'll remove blood from the body, run it through a pump, 
run it through an oxygenator, and then return the blood on the arterial side. So you're really offloading the workload of the myocardium and hopefully preserving the myocardium while really good CPR is being administered with mechanical CPR devices. So again, this is what's called VA ECMO. Um, and the ECMO machines are so tiny. I'm actually going to show you guys a picture um, of them. It used to be like back when I did ECMO in the 1990s, uh, you'd have to have a perfusionist at the bedside and the, the devices were huge. But now the devices are very, very small and, um, and very efficiently can do ECMO. So Demetrianopoulos is probably has got the most experience in the United States with um, eCPR and, you know, the whole full component of using mechanical CPR, ECMO, and taking patients to the cath lab. And this is the protocol he published in 2016 where they'll consider anyone age um, 18 to 75 who have ongoing CPR, who are refractory, um, who have a refractory ventricular fibrillation or VTAC um, that meet criteria. And so his criteria um, are, you know, is their end title at least 10 on arrival? Uh, do they have a PAO2 of greater than 50? or a SAT greater than 85, and is their lactate, lactate less than 18? And so if so, then what they'll do is they'll place the patient on VA ECMO, and then they'll take the patient, uh, they usually place the patient on ECMO in the cath lab, and then um, tr uh, try to perform PCI. And so what is he showing? Well, what he has been able to demonstrate is um, in the first 18 patients, they had a 53% survival, and most of them had a cerebral performance category score of one or two. So, because the thing is, you don't want to do all this, again, to A, create a cardiac cripple, but B, to, um, you know, to put a patient in a situation where they're neurologically damaged. And so these patients, a CPC score of one means you've got no neurologic deficits, and then a two means you might have some minor disability. But um, really good outcomes, and everyone is anxiously awaiting his newest publication where he has a much larger uh, database of patients and really goes into all of the, comp you know, any complication patients have experienced, but also all the good outcomes. So again, just stay tuned um, for Dimitri's paper. It should be published pretty soon. So one of the things he found when he did eCPR is many patients uh, peak troponins way over 100. Um, so these patients will have very, very large troponin levels. Um, one of the cool things, though, is they did daily echocardiograms on these patients, and what they were able to demonstrate is that as the patient progressed post-arrest, uh, many of them recovered their cardiac function. So by discharge, many of them weren't even meeting criteria for heart failure, which is super exciting. I mean, to think you could go from dead to, you know, um, to actually having decent cardiac function. And then who was the best, who had the best chance of survival? Those who had rapid EMS response times, those who actually had cardiac disease, and then those who received bystander CPR. So we cannot say enough of the importance of a bystander CPR out in the community. So ongoing trials, there's actually quite a few groups around the world who are really, you know, working on outcomes and, um, and uh, or just evaluating outcomes in patients who receive eCPR. So there is a registry uh, for patients who are um, getting VA ECMO and eCPR. Um, the University of Michigan is actually doing quite a bit of work. Bob Neumer um, out at, in the University of uh, Michigan is um, uh, doing quite a bit of uh, research in eCPR. And then Brian Grenou, who's um, from British Columbia, is also published quite a few papers on eCPR. So kind of exciting, um, uh, but there's a couple trials. The CHEER trial got published, um, and I'll show you those results in just a little bit. But Prague um, has uh, a big randomized control trial with mechanical CPR, intra-arrest hypothermia, ECMO, and early CAS, and they are... Um, I'm going to be evaluating the outcomes of those patients as well. As well, so pretty exciting. So many of you might have seen this. Um, the a, a paper published a couple of years ago uh, in Paris, where they're actually doing ECMO in the field. So this is a picture from the Louvre Museum, and you can see all the expensive artwork in the background here. But this patient experienced a cardiac arrest in the Louvre Museum. 
got bystander CPR, EMS responded, started mechanical CPR, and then there's a team that comes in a little car and brings, um, uh, are able with a physician to cannulate ECMO actually out in the field. And then the whole idea is they cannulate the patient in the field, get the patient to a, um, a hospital who will take the patient to the cath lab to try to intervene and get that coronary artery opened. And so pretty exciting you can kind of see what this looks like out in the field. And so, you know, many cities across the world have little ECMO um, cars that will actually come to the patient. And you can see this is the size of the ECMO devices. They're itty bitty. They're very, very tiny and very um, portable. So, so pretty exciting. So can, you know, ECMO come to you? And so I don't know of anyone right now um, in the United States who's doing pre-hospital ECMO, but I've um, we have uh, we know that there are quite a few uh, not quite a few, but there are a couple of cities who are planning on starting a program and evaluating outcomes in um, in these situations. So I, just really exciting just to see you know technology and the. Um, you know, the possibilities of what can happen. So I'm going to wrap this up and just let you know about what's happening in the U.S. So um, in the U.S., there is a, a registry and research group called the ERECT uh, Research Group, uh, Extracorporeal Resuscitation Consortium. And, um, and they did a big survey of ECMO centers back in 2016 and um, found uh, almost about 100 ECMO um, centers and about 70 uh, responded. And 36% of these centers were performing ED ECMO. 93% of ECMO programs were based in like academic teaching hospitals, which is not a big surprise because for the most part, um, this is being done in, in you know, tertiary referral centers across the country. 65% um, of ECMO programs are less than five years old. And again, I'm not surprised by that. There's been this big upswing in ECMO. There are many indications uh, for using ECMO. We'll use it for ARDS patients, um, COPD, or sometimes to kind of scrub off uh, CO2. Um, so lots of uh, pulmonary reasons, as well as uh, cardiopulmonary reasons to use ECMO. So, And then in a lot of programs, most of the cannulation is done by cardiothoracic surgeons. Um, perfusionists are many in, involved many times, although they don't need to be for running uh, the devices. And then, of course, pharmacists. And then uh, in, it, it goes without saying nurses. And so the CHEER trial um, uh, published their results a couple of, uh, three years ago, you can see now, where they did mechanical CPR, ECMO, PCI, and hypothermia. And again, saw 96% um, of patients achieved ROSC, of return of spontaneous circulation. You can see the end number here is 26. And then survival to discharge was 54%. So very similar to what Dimitri Yiannopoulos was able to demonstrate in his work. And then uh, survival with favorable neurologic outcome, 54%. So the exciting thing is many of these patients are, are um, surviving with intact neurological outcomes. And again, you know, that would be the, the goal. So what does the AHA say about all of this? Well, they, you know, they, it's reasonable to do it if you know if you've been trained and you're comfortable with it. Um, they've not made a strong recommendation yet to do it, but um, but I think stay tuned. We'll see. You know, as more uh, research is published and you know outcome data is evaluated, um, you know we might see a different recommendation. But um, but you know they, they give it a two B, meaning it's reasonable to do it. You know if you've been trained and if you're comfortable doing it. So, but bottom line, um, so again, don't forget to submit your questions. So. So I'm going to, just in a minute here, hand it over to Janice, but um, let me know what your questions are. I'll try to answer as much as I can. But bottom line, you know, it's all, resuscitation is a big system of care. You know, we've really got to work together between pre-hospital and hospital. Um, you know, bystander CPR is absolutely important early uh, AED administration to try to get patients out of shockable rhythms, you know, emergency departments that can continue that care, um, cath lab, you know, especially for patients with um, who might be considered for eCPR, uh, you know, you've got interventional cardiologists that get involved, and then there's the uh, post-arrest ICU team that cools patients and provides excellent uh, post-arrest care, and then finally, the at the end of the day, the, the whole goal is to get a person back to their pre-functioning state neurologically intact. So with that, I'm just last couple things is I found this really cool website. Um, it's uh, edecmo.org. So it's a, it's a nice website that gives information 
about this whole idea of eCPR. So, um, so I wanted to kind of let you guys know about that. I wanted to share my contact information with you. So I'm on social media and I, I, I put a lot out on social media. Um, I'm on Facebook. It's under Nicole Kupchik Consulting and Education. And then on um, Instagram, I'm at Nicole Kupchik. And I try to stay really active on both of those pa um, those pages. And I'll always, uh, you know, put out the latest, greatest evidence. And then on YouTube, I have a show called 10 Minute Tidbits where, you know, we'll talk about topics like this. But um, the podcast um, I host for Striker Physio Control is called Recess 10. And I've actually interviewed Dimitri Yiannopoulos and Carl. Carl Kern, um, as well as Atman Shaw on the whole idea of eCPR. So if you're into podcasts, it's called Recess 10 because all the interviews are 10 minutes or less. So check out the podcast and, um, you know, and let me know what you think um, about some of the interviews. It's, it's really cool to be able to sit down with, you know, just cutting edge leaders in resuscitation and talk to them and kind of pick their brain about what's happening out there in the um, resuscitation field. So with that, I am going to hand it over to Janice, who is going to give you some information on the CEs, but she's also going to field some of your questions. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole, for this very informative presentation. Every time I listen to you, I always learn something new, so thank you. Um, so we have a lot of great questions, um, but before we get to those questions, I would like to remind everyone that this webinar um, provides continuing education for nurses and respiratory therapists. The activity has been approved um, for one contact hour. Go to saxtesting.com forward slash SL. You will need to register on the test site and complete the evaluation form. Upon, upon successful submission, you'll be able to print your certificate of completion. The accreditation statement is listed below. And I would like to thank Physio Control and Striker again for their support. The on-demand version will be accredited for nurses and respiratory therapists. And with that said, I will get to some questions. You ready, Nicole? I am ready. <laughs> I'm ready. Sure. <laughs> okay. Great. So my first question I have from Brian, any tips on how to implement an ECPR program? Yeah. Well, I, you know, here's the deal. Okay. So if you work in a facility that does or who's thinking about doing ECMO, ECPR is not what I would start with. I mean, honestly, you need to get some practice with ECMO itself. Um, so, and I will tell you, it's a process. I, you know, every facility who does ECMO should have an ECMO coordinator. You've got to have, so if you're wanting to get started, how do you get started? Well, number one, you've got to get people on board, right? You've got to get administration who buys into this and will support it. You've got to have an ECMO coordinator. You've got to have a cardiologist who's willing to take these patients to the cath lab. You've got to have a cath lab that's educated and ready to receive these patients. You've got to have an emergency department that's, you know, willing to do this. You've got to have an EMS system that also is, you know, getting patients out of the field. Um, and so it really, uh, to be just very brutally honest, this is not a program that happens overnight. This is a program that takes some time. I would say I wouldn't be surprised if it took a year to plan a program, but it's worth it. But you've just got to make sure you set the program up right. You get all of your ducks in a row. You've got to make sure everyone's on the same page. You've got protocols. You've got your staff trained that so that people are comfortable with ECMO. I mean, I would definitely recommend um, doing simulation with ECMO uh, just so people are super comfortable with it. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Okay. Um, so the next question I have, Teresa actually wanted to know, what does ERECT stand for again? She just wanted to give oh, some geez. information on that. <laughs> so it's, it's extra, I know. Well, it's so funny. Okay. I'll say it. It stands for Extracorporeal Resuscitation Consortium. Their whole idea was erect, like your brain, you're taking somebody who's dead and get, putting them in a functional place again. So that's where their name came from. So anyway, yeah, it's an interesting name. <laughs> so very much so. Yeah, okay, sorry. great. That's okay. So I have another question from Paige. Um, your thoughts on ECMO and sepsis? Oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's, if they've got ARDS, absolutely, you know, um, and that's, in fact, that's the, but it's going to be a different type of ECMO. So it wouldn't be VA ECMO, it would be VV ECMO. So, um, you know, a, a lot of facilities will put patients on um, ECMO who have ARDS, 
as a complication of sepsis. So now to use it as a treatment for sepsis, I don't, you know, we just don't have data on it yet. Um, it's, it's an interesting thought uh, to just for cardiac collapse because many of these patients die of, um, uh, of uh, shock, you know, um, I don't know, it's an interesting thought. Uh, but uh, for as a complication of ARDS, absolutely, to rest the lungs. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, James actually asked the question, is there a list of hospitals that perform ECMO? Like, can they find that information anywhere just to maybe... Oh, you know, contact. yes, yes, okay. So I know, um, okay, there is, because the um, erect um, group actually had a map with all of the um, the ECMO centers, and you know, I just don't know on the top of my head exactly where you would go to find that, but I would say um, I've got the, re the resource for this paper, and they had a map with all of the ECMO centers as of two years ago, and then I'll bet you if you just Google um, ECMO centers in the United States, I'll bet you'll be able to find um, who they are. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, Brian, thoughts okay. about ECMO to go, meaning cannulating, then transporting to a center that has the ICU level care to manage the complexities that come with a patient on ECMO. Yeah, I mean, and this, this is where things are going, right? Because and the whole idea is pr really preserving that patient's myocardium. I mean, a reality is if you've got patient, uh, somebody who's collapsed in the field, so we're talking cardiac arrest, they've collapsed in the field, um, they get bystander CPR, EMS is called, uh, EMS, let's say they're super quick, they shock three times and decide, let's transport. I mean, time ticks really quickly. And I mean, easily in a half hour can pass, you know, before you get that patient to an ECMO center. So, and I think that is the whole idea behind bringing ECMO to the patient. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we don't have clear data on if that's exactly the way to go, but that that is what's being evaluated right now. So I would say stay tuned. I mean, this is so new and so cutting edge. Like literally, it's just like the last five years that we're really starting to get to gather some data on this. Um, so I would say stay tuned, but that's the direction things are heading. Okay, great. And I have a couple questions regarding um, elaborating a little more on the Impala device and how it ties into the eCPR. Yeah, so... Information. Yeah, so there's a, there, I, I know a couple of cardiologists myself who will use Impella, and basically Impella is a ventricular assist device. Now, I'm going to say, I, like, I don't know if they have an exact, I'm not, a, I don't have any affiliation with the company that makes Impella, so let's, let, me, let me just say that. But the way it's being used clinically is that they'll put the Impella device, um, insert it, and so it'll, what happens is it's a kind of a rotator motor type device um, that's inserted percutaneously, and they'll cross the aortic valve, and what this device does, it's really cool, is it takes blood from the left ventricle and pushes it out to the aorta, decreasing the workload of the heart. And so the device is being used to decrease that, that myocardial workload. So super, I mean, exciting, you know, so it's a, it's a different option from ECMO. I mean, ECMO would be pretty full support, but um, but if you put a, a 5.0 Impella, I mean, you're, you can get up to, you know, five liters cardiac output assistance with that. Okay, great. Thank you. So I have a question from Bradley. ECMO requires anticoagulation. Are they doing any testing in the field trials as well as prior to initiation of ECMO? And if so, with what device? Yeah, um, so so Dimitri's paper that should be, I'm, I need to find out when he's going to publish that, but, um, but it, he looks at all the specifics of the therapy with ECMO, because you're right, they do have to be anticoagulated, and so um, I know one of the things he was looking at was bleeding and bleeding indices, um, so I would say, again, just stay tuned. I will definitely, as soon as he publishes that paper, I will put it out on social media, and um, and, I, and I would, I'm hoping in the next six months to interview him again uh, once his paper gets published. So I'll probably do a YouTube and um, and podcast interview with him uh, just to uh, get his perspective on what they found. Um, but I just, you know, the thing is, is we have this kind of big picture idea of doing eCPR, but now it's time for centers who have experience to start looking at the specifics of the therapy, and that's what um, what Dimitri is doing. So, I, so stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll know soon. 
Okay, great. Another question. This looks like another John. Um, does in the field ECMO make sense in only certain urban areas or do you think it would work anywhere? No, I, you know, I mean, honestly, I, I think you've got to start with urban areas. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah, just to be honest, I mean, you know, because I, I teach out in, you know, eastern Washington and eastern Oregon, where literally it can take an, you know, an hour to get to a hospital. And I, I don't like if for good outcomes, I'm just not sure that that's the place where, you know, you would do eCPR, maybe mechanical CPR to get them to a hospital, but I think really until we get comfortable with the therapy, it really should be, you know, concentrated in urban areas. Okay, that's a good point. So I have another um, question kind of comment just to get your thoughts. So Mochkin, I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, stated that they're doing mechanical CPR trials in their ED, and they're unsure about moving it, um, making it hospital-wide um, okay. regarding evidence and not sure if there's enough evidence to push it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you know, like I was mentioning earlier, it's just you're, we're not going to have evidence. We're just not um, because there's so much bias that's introduced. And I think it really just needs to come down to, you know, an institutional decision. Um, if you've ever measured the quality of your CPR, and I'm going to, if you're like most hospitals, it's doing manual CPR is really, really difficult. There's so much mattress swing. We have too many breaks. Um, it's just, it's hard to hit depth. And if, if you're able to kind of show that, you know what, we're not cutting it with manual CPR, you know, why not just take a year and try mechanical CPR and see how it goes? Um, but here's the key is if you're going to do mechanical CPR, Staff have got to be trained on how to put these devices on efficiently. If it takes you a minute to get this device on, you've just lost your benefit. Um, but there are many agencies um, who've been able to show, demonstrate they can get these devices on in less than 10 seconds. Um, but you've got to make sure, and, and does that mean you train every staff person? No, I honestly think you'd have just like a team that knows that's really efficient on putting these devices on. And, you know, so again, you're not going to ever have like strong data that says this is superior because of the bias that's introduced in research. Okay, that makes sense. Um, another question, Mabuse um, has a question about how do you use eCPR in children? Or has that even been a study yet. Yeah, well, you know, one of the challenges, um, so ECMO is, I mean, th there's tons of experience, um, you know, in child, in pediatric pe population with ECMO. Um, one of the challenges uh, is most cardiac arrests and, and uh, peds are primary respiratory in nature. And so it is, it's a different type, I mean, peds have different types of arrests, right? So it's usually respiratory in nature, or um, maybe it's a congenital, especially in really, really little babies. Um, so I think the model would look different. And besides that, the mechanical CPR devices do not fit most kids. They're, they're really, they're meant for adults. And so, um, you know, um, I think it would look just a little different, but really, I mean, big, uh, big, referral centers, especially that do cardiac, do ECMO already on, on kids. Now, do they do it while CPR is ongoing? I honestly don't know how many are doing it. I, I really don't know. So I'm not really sure how to answer that. Okay. Um, but kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, I had another question that says um, regarding the mechanical CPR devices or morbidly obese patients. How, how has that worked? Yeah. Or well, it's... Yeah, no, that's a great question. And here's the deal is you have to ask where do they carry their weight? So mm -hmm. if you carry your weight on, you know, your backside, then it, it shouldn't be a problem. But um, if you've got somebody who has a really, really broad chest, so I'm not talking arms, but, you know, like under their arms, if their chest is really broad, they may not fit the device. Um, most of them, the manufacturers say that um, the devices fit up to 90% of people. And I mean, I'll be honest, some of them, you got to really squish them in, right, um, to get them to fit but I mean that's that's okay uh, but if you've got somebody who's really really big these devices will not fit them okay awesome so a couple of another question is just is just one thrown out there that we talked about early defibrillation um, someone asked about sending getting AEDs for the community what, what are your thoughts on that or having one available um, throughout a hospital campus or if they're small oh 
Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. The answer is yes. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, can you, yeah. So, I mean, really AED should be available. I believe they should be available to the, in, you know, in public areas, especially on a hospital campus. The reality is a code team can't go out, you know, to parking garages. I mean, I guess they can, and I know some do, but, but, you know, yes. I mean, having an, an AED available, I'd say absolutely. All right, and Jonathan actually asked about survival rate with eCPR. How can you tell if a person would not have survived with eCPR, and um, is there a measure of quality of life after eCPR is administered? Yeah, so um, so here's the deal. It's hard to get like the um, a comparison because most patients who have VFib that need intervention, we just gave up on them. Most of them died, to be quite frankly honest. And so there, it's really hard to do to know like a historical, um, you know, how they would compare historically because we let most of them go. And so, you know, that that question is really hard to answer. Um, uh, but the quality of life piece is the surrogate that we use is the CPC score. So that's that cerebral performance category score. And most of them were a one or two, which means they did not, they either didn't have neurologic deficits or they had minimal disability, which is good. Okay. Because if you were getting CPC scores of like three and four, I would be like, no, you know, just stop this therapy. This is crazy. Uh, but the, the CPC scores were actually really good. Okay, cool. Another question with regards to eCPR or sorry, mechanical CPR in pregnancy. Is that also again where your weight oh. is distributed? Or oh, come on, you guys all know pregnancy is always excluded. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't. Yeah, I mean, we're not even close to evaluating pregnancy, even with I, the know, mechanical CPR. No, I mean, I don't think it's been evaluated at all. I mean, yeah, well, but first of all, it's not common occurrence that somebody who's young of childbearing years actually has a cardiac arrest. It's, it's a very rare occurrence uh, to start, but um, it, I, it, I know of not a single study, I should say, that has evaluated that. Great question, though. Okay. I love the question. Okay. Um, so, Teresa, she wanted to know how does ECMO possibly cause low EF? No, well, an ECMO doesn't cause low EF. It's not having ECMO that we worry about a low ejection fraction. So, it's not having that cardiac support that, right, that raises the concern of, um, of causing cardiac dysfunction. So the whole point of ECMO is to support the heart so that you don't become, in my words, a cardiac cripple. Gotcha. All right. So um, I think that is all the questions that I have as of right now. And um, I would like to thank you everyone for their questions and for attending this webinar. It was awesome. Thank you, Nicole, for this lovely presentation. And I think I will hand this back over to Emily. I'd like to thank you very much for your time, both Nicole, for this very informative presentation, and as well to you, Janice, for being our moderator today. It has been such a pleasure working with you both, and I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the live audience today, and as well as those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session. We thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. And now this does conclude our session for today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.